Um, welcome, and as always, whenever Hawk graces our screen, we know that we're in for an amazing time. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Hawk and Freda. I will be back toward the end. If you have any questions, you'll be able to call us and chat with our very special guest, Javier Bardem. Thank you, guys. Enjoy. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Hawk. Thank you, Javier. We're so excited for today. Um, this is officially our 30th show. Um, so, yay, Hawk. Thanks for inviting us into your Rolodex once again. We look forward for a wonderful show. Thank you, and, and welcome, everybody. I'm honored to introduce our to our audience today an Oscar winner uh, with another three nominations, including this year for portraying Desi Arnaz in Being the Ricardos. To add to those accolades, he's won Best Actor Awards at Cannes, Venice, BAFTA, and six Goyas. Add to that, he is an ambassador of Greenpeace for the protection of Antarctica. So there's a real, real heart in there. One of the finest actors working today. Come on in and happy, happy birthday to you, Javier Bardem. Come Thank on in. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hi there. So, Hello. so great to uh, have you. I'm just going to full screen here. All and right. uh, it's very exciting. And um, we're going to start quick because we only have an hour. So okay. um, first, I have to tell you that uh, I'm I'm on the board of AMC Theaters and my CEO, Adam Aaron, introduced you and Nicole uh, at a theater in uh, at the Grove, actually. And uh, of course, somebody's doing something that I can't understand here. <laughs> I'm seeing you and hearing you perfectly. For OK. Your... Uh, any rate, um, he wanted to thank you for being there and Perfect. for uh, supporting theatrical exhibition, which a lot of us here really want. So uh, let's get started. Both your mother and your maternal grandparents were actors. As a young child, was emulating them the career you wanted, or was there something else that you wanted to do? I think it was more about trying to do something else uh, because I wasn't a very good student, I have to say. I was very active. It was, it was very hard for me to be sitting down in a chair for more than five minutes. Uh, I guess somebody else will call, a professional would call it today, uh, will give it a name to that. Uh, back in the day, you will be just a nervous kid with lots of, with a lot of need to express himself. But I wanted, I, I didn't want to be an actor because I saw since I was born how hard this is. I saw my mom uh, being unemployed for long periods, like a couple of years, for example, where she was going through a hard time because she was raising me and my brother and sister by herself, since my dad was there, but it was not helping as much as he could or he should. Uh, so I saw that and I was like, I don't want this kind of life. I want some stability. And we all know that performing, being an actor, is the opposite of stability. It's like you're dealing with the unknown. And yet I, I read that you had your first acting gig where, when you were like six. Am I wrong? Yes. I was at school and a teacher came to me and said, your mom is looking for you. And I said, what's going on? I said, well, there's a kid in the show that I'm playing that got sick. And the director asked me to... If I could bring my own kid, would you like to go and do? And I said, okay. If I have, if I can skip the school, it looks cool. And my mom told me they're gonna give you a toy. I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> so <laughs> I went a toy there. Or a lollipop. <laughs> exactly. I went there, and then uh, the the scene was supposed to be. It was like in the 15th century. He was supposed to be these two thieves with a gun that were playing with me, and I was supposed to have fun with it, but I started to cry. And the director uh, called Fernando Fernand Gomez, which is a, a god in Spain, he said, okay, it's fine. He's a dramatic actor. It's fine. I can take it. <laughs> uh, 
Now, I understand, uh, given the Oscars are coming up, and again, you're nominated, again, congratulations. Thank you. Um, I understand, it. did you grow up watching the Oscars? Did you, was it on television in Spain? Well, it is late. It starts at 2 a.m., so the Oscars were not as po I mean, they're popular, and of course, it got more and more popular. I remember watching the, the Oscars with Bob Hope presenting them, and, and my father having a blast, uh, laughing, and me going, "What's the fun of it all?" Because uh, because it was it wasn't translated, it was in English, and they had subtitles, and I was not able to read the subtitles. So I was like, "What's what he's laughing about?" But then. I would say that the first, the very first Oscar night that I really truly enjoy at its full was in 93 because Fernando Trueba won Best International Picture for a movie called Belle Epoque. Yes. And that's the first a show that I stayed whole night with 24 years old watching the show. And I loved it. Yeah. And the the first time you were nominated, which by the way, if people don't know, you were the first Spanish actor ever nominated for hmm. Best Actor. I think that's incredible. <laughs> and where have they been all this? They're like, we've been asleep all this time, not to have nominated somebody before. But uh, you played uh, the Cuban poet, Ronaldo Arenas. Mm -hmm. And I understand, I have to tell you a quick story. I had Ooh. Edward Norton on the other day, and after wow. he got the part in Primal Fear, Richard Gere left a message on his hotel machine congratulating him. And to this day, Edward has that message. And his mom was a big uh, Richard Gere fan, so I he played it for his mom. And I understand that you're a big Pacino fan and that, in fact, Pacino called to congratulate you. Tell me about that. He was... What I did before my falls with the great and uh, loving Julian Snabel, I thought nobody was going to watch the movie. Not because I didn't trust him as a director, but because I thought, who's going to really care about a movie about a Cuban gay poet uh, done, played by me? No one. So I kind of tried to experiment with the fact of seeing if I'm able to perform in English. It was my first movie in English. Uh, and then the movie opened, and it went very well. And that success of that reception of the movie took me by surprise. And I was sleeping one day at night at my home, two o'clock in the morning. And the, back in back in the two thousand, there were no such a thing as cell phones, or there were very few. So there were phones, hard lines with answering machines, as you know. And then two o'clock in the morning, there's a phone call. <clears throat> I stand up like because you go something is wrong. My mom or some, I get the phone, but it was too late, and I and I go Who, who's that? And I press play, and it was Al Pacino saying that he saw the movie with Julian and he loved my performance and he wants to congratulate me, and I was like in tears, and I played that tape on and on and on for twenty minutes, <laughs> and of course I have it with me. Of course, and of course, I played to everyone: my mom, my brother, my sister, everybody, even 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 the owner of the apartment, to see if I can play less. <laughs> and did you ever get? Have you met Al over the years? Yeah, then I then I would say six months later, I had the chance to meet him in in Toronto, in the festival, and we were having lunch, Julian and I, and he was coming to join us, and I went. When it was five minutes before he will come into the room, I went to the bathroom with a photo camera. Again, there were no cell phones. And I took a picture to the mirror of my face because I was like like a teenager meeting Backstreet Boys. Wow. And, and, and then he came in. And of course, of course, then you meet this beautiful, humble, generous, fun, caring, loving man. And, and, and then... Even what you thought of him goes even higher and higher. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's true. I I understand uh, I understand that, and I think it's exciting. And I love that. What a lot of people don't understand is we're the biggest fans of all the other people that we Absolutely. work with. Like, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I I can't. You know, there's I'm sure there's a DP that. Oh my God, I got to work with Gordon Willis, Godfathers, mm -hmm. Manhattan, Annie Hall. You know, I mean, it's. One of the greats. So, at any rate, um, 
tell me, so now you, you get nominated and you come to the Oscars. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it like that, that first night where you're there? And I'm sure there were a lot of people who, not just Al, but all these other presenters and nominees yeah. that you were excited about. What was, well, what was it I like? Brought, I brought my mother, which it was my date, and uh, my brother and sister, and I was walking the carpet and of course I knew that I didn't have a chance to win, but who cares? I was there among all these, as you very well said, Hawk, people, artists, directors, actors, actresses, screenwriters, DPs, that you so much admire and want to be part of it. And just if I was talking to my mom saying, this is like a DVD store, this is like, like a blockbuster <laughs> DVD store. The, all the movies are here. <laughs> when you go to different shelves to get the DVD back in the day, and you see all these actors in the in the covers of the DVDs, they were all there. So for me, it was like wow. And then I I especially have the memory of of meeting Tom Hanks, which he was super nice with me. Uh, he was super, and, and Ed Harris, my my fellow nominees of the day, and uh, and it's. As you very well described before, it's a feeling of humbleness, of belonging or being in a group of people that you so much admire and respect and thank for what they've done. Huh? Oh, I, I totally understand. Just again, I got to just remember when you say this, I remember one of the early movies that I was a first AD on. I got to work with Jimmy Stewart. Oh, my God. Wow. I worked with Jimmy Stewart. I mean, I. Hi, Jimmy. I, I don't even know how you'd describe something like that. <laughs> so now you get nominated again for No Country for Old Men. Again, you bring your mom. Yeah. Now, you th you probably thought, hey, maybe there's a chance this time. Yeah. But I'm when you won, you got up there. You were, you were brilliant. I watched again <laughs> what you said. But then you spoke to your mom in, in Spanish. Yes. Can you tell us what you said? Of course. That, that that moment, I did something that today looks like a miracle. I brought 17 people with me. My <laughs> agent, which is Elise Search from... Uh, uh, hi, Elise, if you're listening. Our yeah, old hi, Elise. We love you. I don't know how she did it, but she was able of getting 10, 17 tickets. So I brought all my friends from the school, everybody. And I remember I was getting dressed, and I don't know how to do a tie. I don't know. So... All my friends were there and said, okay, we're late. I need someone to make the tie. Come on, Julio. Julio is a good friend of mine. And Julio said, no, 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 me. He said, come on, Julio, you do a tie. You go to the office every day. Do a tie. Only 40 million people is going to watch. Come on. And I remember his, his hands shaking and <laughs> making the tie. <laughs> and uh, then I, 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 yeah, I got the chance to get on stage. And what I wanted to say to my mom is to really... Uh, show the respect and admiration and uh, gratitude to her parents, my grandparents, who really brought the dignity to her. Uh, like, that generation of actors and actresses in Spain brought a lot of dignity to our craft, because back in the day, they were considered, I don't know, horrible people. We we're talking about the Franco regime, the dictatorship, and they were people that were persecuted, pursued, and I wanted to say thank you because of them, I can stay here today because they taught you the respect and love for your craft, for our craft. And you, mom, taught me to, to have respect uh, for my craft and for the people that, uh, that, that is part of it. So That's I wanted wonderful. to share that with her. Very, very quick, though, because it was 45 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that was really wonderful. And as a matter of fact, for those of you who haven't seen Parallel Mothers, which your your wife is yes. also nominated uh, this year. Fantastic. But again, that that heartfelt thing about the Graves and Franco and what they did, just exactly what you were talking about. So, absolutely. Absolutely. So now I'm gonna ask some some acting questions because I've got oh. several friends, uh, one of which is Deb Aquila, one of the great casting directors mm -hmm. around, but bilingual speakers often say they feel the most emotional and deeply connected to language when they're speaking their first language. Is the approach or preparation 
different when you're acting in English as opposed to acting in Spanish? Absolutely. It's a different game when uh, it has to do with the education and also with the DNA, with the images, the sensations, the, the feelings that a word can, uh, can uh, feel to your system immediately, spontaneously. When I'm working in a, in a language where I wasn't raised by or with, I have to kind of do an operation, a surgery to bring those emotions to words that don't mean much to myself, because I I didn't have so I didn't have too many experiences, right. personal experiences with those words. That has changed now because now I've been working in English or speaking English, I don't know now twenty years. So now I have more experience with the with the language. But in the beginning, it was it was tough <clears throat> because it was more of a phonetic situation of how to pronounce. But today, still, I have to work hard on with the dialect coach to be able to be understood. But uh, it, it is more about really bringing the full emotion and sensation into those words. When in Spanish, I just jump into it and right, it's, it. it's your language. So tell us, how do you prepare for each character? Is there a backstory, a specific imagery that you use? Yeah, I like to, I like to, I like to, to imagine where he's coming from, what's the background. I don't get too crazy about it. I'm not, I'm not obsessed with it, but it helps me to have a sensation of belonging to something that comes from, from long ago, rather than trying to, uh, uh, trying to, what's the word, uh, deliver something immediately that is written on the page. I, I want to get to that page and to those lines with the with the run, with the run from the past, with with something that has to do with where I'm coming from and where I'm going to. So that helps me. But also, uh, I prepare with my acting coach. I've been working with him since I started when I was 20. He's the same, he's Juan Carlos Coraza. He's from Argentina, lives in, lives in Spain. And he's a good friend of mine, he's a master. And he really helps me to, I don't know, to box together. Because when you are, especially when you are preparing for a movie, mostly you are on your own. And you are at, at your office or your house, your bedroom, whatever, and you're thinking, imagining, and it's hard because you don't have the time to rehearse with the other actors. So I need someone to, to do the, the sparring with me. Right. Do you create create key events in the character's life from the from the text, from the script? and those that might not be in the script, but emotionally relevant? Absolutely, yeah. That helps me to understand and trigger the need of that character to say or do that or this thing. Mm -hmm. Like the relationship between what you've read or what you've imagined and create a pool of images and ideas and experiences that you can imagine that will trigger his actions for sure. Otherwise, I, I feel I'm working on the vacuum. I'm working on the emptiness of it all. Right. Uh, but again, I don't get too crazy about it because I'm 53 years old today. <laughs> yes. And of course, I've been 20, 20 years old like everybody else. And when I was 20, I wanted to feel the pain. I wanted to feel the suffering. I wanted to be more method than Brando himself. Ah, and... It didn't make me a better actor. I I I I I I went through very I don't know intense, uh, absolutely gra gra gratuity moments where I could have done even better without going through that process. And as a good friend of mine said, when you are so much into the character for twenty four hours, you may do your best scenes in the catering service or when you're going to the bathroom and the camera is not rolling. <laughs> so you want to be prepared when the camera is rolling. <laughs> But I absolutely understand that other actors need to be immersed in that for the whole day. I find it very exhausted myself. Right. No, I've I've watched both of them. Of course. <laughs> one who's method and the other one who there's a there's a great moment. I don't know if you know about this, but Jack Lemon, the great Jack Lemon, I got to work with a couple of times, and he would he he would talk and tell jokes. And when he heard rolling, he would turn 
to his spot and go magic time. And he was in character until cut. And then he'd go, he'd go back and tell a joke and then boom, that he'd say the words magic time and that would be his mantra. And he'd be right in that character. And then there were other people who we worked with that I won't mention that were going, will you stay with me, please? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, didn't work. Didn't I, met, I met uh, Jack uh, Lemon on an elevator in Berlin Film Festival in 1996. And I remember being so stuck in my own body, like, because we were sharing the elevator, him and me alone going, I don't know, it was two floors down. <laughs> I felt like, like I couldn't breathe, like I'm near Jack Lemon. It was, and, uh, and again, you could you could feel the energy of a very nice, warm, amazing, I mean, genius he was. Uh, wow. Now, I know you have a couple of kids now, you, yes. and, you and Penelope. You played this lovely, lovely character, I'll call him, Uxball in Beautiful. Mm -hmm. where for those of you who don't remember he played a, a man who was dying of prostate cancer and he's trying to take care of his two children yeah did that in because you hadn't had your kids yet did that no. inform how you were going to be a parent with your own children in a way yes because that was a uh, 2008 and 9 and it was 40 years i i when i did that movie and before that i was having a lot of Problems. I mean, not struggle with being a father. I guess because I'm coming with, with my own backpack, and my father was not as present as I wish. Blah blah blah. You work through psychotherapy with it, and then when you're ready, you just feel it. But I wasn't ready when I was doing that movie, even. And the fact that I could share so many months with those two kids and get into the world of being a father, a father that sacrificed himself for those two kids. A single father who has to take care of those two little human beings really opened a flame within myself that I was expecting about wow, what is this unconditional love looks like? Because I guess my thing was, are you able to are you able and capable of really give yourself for someone else to a point where you would die for that person if needed? I wasn't ready for that. I was more, way more selfish than that. But I guess that movie helped me to open the door toward that feeling a little bit more. And then the relationship with my actual wife started to happen. And it came naturally that I really wanted to be uh, a father. And I think a little bit of it has to do with that movie. Mm. Now, do, do your kids want to be actors too? I mean, they got their parents for both. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. The thing is, I don't know. It's something that we, my wife and I, we always talk about, which is we are blessed. We are not only, we belong to that 10% of actors that work, but not only that, within that 10%, we are in that 1% of actors that work constantly and with great projects. So this is not common. This is not something that oh, yeah. really you can take for, for, for granted. But our kids are watching that. And it's like we try to remind them. They're, they're little. They're 11 and 9. Remind them that this is, not, this is not the common path for any actor. Yeah. But if we are there, it's because we, we work hard. We prepare ourselves. But also we've been blessed with luck and with choices for great people. But we try to make them understand that you have to work. You have to work. You have to be constant. You have to sacrifice. You have to be prepared, whether it's for acting or for being a doctor, for being a musician, for being whatever. And that's what we really intend them to understand. And I think we are uh, achieving it. That being said, I don't think any of those two guys are lawyers because they are all over the place. They are expressive. They are they they really are in touch with their feelings and the expression of it. They've and got the genes. That. They've got the genes. I guess. Yes. So now this year you're nominated for a very different Cuban than the than the uh -huh. gay poet you you did years ago, Desi Arnaz. 
how, how did you research? Did you know, I mean, was Lucy, I Love Lucy on television or had you ever seen it before? What did you know? How did you research? No, really. I mean, I Love Lucy was huge here, as we know, but it wasn't that big in Spain. So when I first heard about the project, it was because I was interested in knowing who the Lucille Ball and Dusty Arnaz were. So I started to dig in those episodes and I discovered the world of those two amazing genius, geniuses and I immediately fall in love with them both, but I wasn't familiar with them. And then I read his uh, Desi Arnaz autobiography called A Book, which is a very smart, intelligent, fun, and also tough reading because it explains the story of Cuba, uh, his friends in Cuba and in the States. Uh, but uh, I start to prepare based on what I, what I begin to, to see through the videos. And I think that helped me to have a clear idea rather than coming to the job with a huge weight about the icon, about the expectation of the icon. I didn't have that. And I guess that helped me to be more free in order to achieve what I thought it was the, the most important thing to achieve, which was the essence of that person, of that personality. Right. Now, we all know Aaron Sorkin's dialogue is like, he doesn't like a the changed. <laughs> now, how, how did that work with you having to do all of the, the Cuban stuff? Were you, was he as a stickler with you as he usually is? Well, I have to say that I was the envy of the whole cast because I could change some words from Aaron Sorkin <laughs> myself, meaning I'm a foreign actor playing a foreign character. So I could say, hold on, what about this? What about that? I don't know if he would say that word. Or, and he was super nice and super open. And But at the same time, I would see how he would be very strict with other actors in their natural uh, English language. language. Yeah. But... Uh, I let me tell you, I mean, his, his boundless talent, uh, it, is, it is a gift for any actor to have those words. It's like butter in your mouth. It, I mean, it, it really melts. You don't have to fight through it. Yeah. It comes to you and it comes and goes, comes and goes. There are, it's a natural flow based on the very thorough preparation that he has as a screenwriter, knowing what an actor and a character needs to say when and how. It's it's so. I would say that mostly most of his most of his direction as a director is through the writing. It's like what Woody Allen told us in Big Cristina Barcelona in 2007 uh, when I was asking him for some uh, I mean direction. He will run away, <laughs> as you know. He he doesn't want to give too many notes. And one day he told me, "Stop, Javier, stop." You know. I do my direction through my writing and through my casting. I wrote that, I chose you because I know that you and what I wrote can link together. Now do your thing, do your thing. I was like, okay. <laughs> wow, well now, aside from Woody, I mean, I'm just gonna list these amazing directors you've worked with, Inaratu, Milos, who's one of my heroes, the Love Coen it. brothers, Dennis, Another movie that's uh, Dune that's nominated this year, yeah. Villeneuve, Sam Mendes, Aronofsky, Ashkar Farati, who again is a hero of mine, and Woody. Uh, is your process different with each one? And you told us about what happened with Woody. Now, I, I know, because, again, because of Edward and, and uh, Birdman, he was telling me about how Inaratu worked. How did you work with Inaratu? Well, He's very intense. He's a person who really wants to go to the bottom of it all. And I would say that Beautiful was the first movie that he brought and directed on his own. And the first one about one character alone. When before that, there were always three stories uh, um, immersed in, in, in each other. Yeah. And I, like I Meryl, guess... Meryl, yes. Yeah. 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 And I guess... I guess that meant that it was going to be more intense than ever because the whole weight of the drama was going to be in one, in one character's shoulders alone. And okay, so, okay, sorry, go ahead. No, no. And, and, and 
I loved working with him. I think he's one of the best directors ever. Uh, it was a movie and a character and a situation that it was very tough to be in for many months. But I'm so proud of the process and I'm so proud of the result. And I would love to work with him again because also that was 13 years ago and I'm a yeah. different man. Uh, I would take things differently as I did back in the day, uh, which I would say was more me being way too immersed in something that it may not help the performance uh, because I wasn't in a very good personal space myself. So I kind of used that and it didn't work. I mean, as I said before, not always your own things, your own experiences or traumas or pain or even joy is going to help you to, be, to do a better job. It may block you from doing what you have to do as an actor because there are things that you haven't, what's the word, uh, fixed or, or resolved still. And if you play with those things, you're going to be caught in those dramas yourself rather than be able to open and fly, fly to your character, fly to the story. So the Cone Brothers, which is your award-winning film, yeah. uh, was in the script, uh, did it describe what his hair looked like? Or <laughs> no. did, did, you, did you do that or where, how did that happen? What a hairdo. What the hell happened there? Okay, so I, I had I, I left my hair long because I didn't know what they were going for. And I sat down on the makeup trailer before shooting in New Mexico and the Coen brothers came with a book of photos of a brothel uh, in the border of Mexico and, and Texas with uh, a photo of a guy and two prostitutes, big ones, huge ones. A uh, great picture. And the guy was wearing that haircut. And as soon as I saw that picture, I started to laugh. And I said as a joke, you're not pretending me to wear that haircut. And they were laughing. Yes, we do. And it was a like, shit. And then, <laughs> then the hairdresser, which is his name was Paul, uh, that he passed away. He was a genius. Paul LeBlanc? Yeah, Paul LeBlanc. Oh, I work with him. Genius. Yeah. Genius. In a second, and the haircut was there. And it was like, oh my, and they were laughing, ha, ha, ha. And I understood absolutely right in the moment that it was a Coen Brothers character. Because that haircut, along with the atrocities that this character does, is such a contradiction. It's fun and terrifying at the same time, like any good Coen Brothers character. Now, I heard there on the last day of shooting, uh, there's kind of a funny story about your hair. Can you yeah, relay yeah. that to us? I have to take an elevator to go to a second floor where we were shooting the scene. And then I'm always wearing a hairnet, like an old, like good old lady to have my hair in place. And then the elevator opened and everybody in the crew with the Coen brothers being the first ones on the line were wearing a hairnet <laughs> as a gift, as a wrap gift for me. <laughs> and then they give me a cake and with candles and every candle has a photo of every character that I killed in the movie. And I think there were like 17. <laughs> oh my God. Well, so, so I'm, I'm curious about something now. You engage in such dark, disturbed personas so masterfully, especially because every time I've seen you being interviewed, and even today, you truly come off as such a kind, thoughtful, caring human being. Thank you. Oh, are your darker, villainish roles like No Country and Skyfall, the blonde, uh, yes. harder or easier for you to do than the more gentle, even if they're complicated, characters like an Eat, Pray, Love or The Sea Inside? Think, I, I don't know. I think, I think, I don't know. I think we all have everything inside. And the fun of being an actor is that you are, you are forced to put the mirrors out there and, and see sides of yourself that you are not maybe used to, or you are not very happy with, but that's part of the process. And that's part of the therapy as well as an actor, like, like your empathy expands because it starts with your own self. If you want to be an actor, you have to get used to really show you show many aspects of yourself that you're not happy with or you're not married to, because you're asked to do so to play 
characters like No Country for All Men, meaning we all have a killer inside. We all have thought in one moment in our lives, oh, I would kill that person. But then ethical uh, values and uh, moral values and humanity values comes into place, and we don't do that. But, but you have to get into that little seed of hate and pain and horror and violence that made you think for a second, oh, I would kill that person. And then work around it and make it grow, and make it grow, make it grow, and then be that seed. Once what it once was, was, was a seed, now it's a huge tree. And sustain it for months, because that's why you're playing, a guy that can do such a horrible thing. And I think it's, it's fun and also allows you to really put your ghosts out there and play with them and see that as many things in life as we know, what we imagine is way worse than what it is. You're amazing. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> if you had the chance to portray anyone in history, uh, have you got someone in mind that you've always admired or wanted to, wanted to play? I wanted to play Hernán Cortés, the conqueror, uh, who went to Mexico and created this uh, uh, conquest and also called, we can call it genocide as well. I mean, seeing from what it is today, it's very easy to judge history through, 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 uh, through the time. We have to get into those mindsets of the time and what were the values back there. Uh, and I was going to play that role for an Amazon uh, short series, but the pandemic happened and it was canceled. But funny enough, I was able to play it for two weeks. And in a way, my system, I, I put that out of my system. Like I had it and I play it. It, it, it went to nowhere, but at least I had the chance to play it. Well, uh, Helen Mirren's husband, Taylor Hackford, a great yes. director, buddy of mine, has had that Cortez script forever. Yes, so I'm sorry, it's out of your system because I was going to call Taylor and say, <laughs> "Get him the, get him the script." I have it. I have it. I still have it, so it's okay. We can call Taylor. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, is there a is there a director you've already you can't say Inaratu again because you already okay. said you'd like to work with him again? But is there another director or an actor that you really want to work with that you're just wow? Yeah. I, just... I mean, there's one. There are many, but. Uh, Steven Spielberg. I mean, which ah. I, had the chance, I had the chance to meet several times, and again, it's such a wonderful, sweet man. Uh, I, when I was, I don't know, when I was 12, I was 12, I remember watching E.T. on movie theater 24 times. 24 wow. times that I played with my own pocket. Wow. Uh, that's how crazy, that's how important the movie is for me. And I love that movie. And then I met him and I went to his office and the AT was there. <laughs> and again, I was like shaking, like, no, I cannot believe. And he was super nice, super sweet. And we tried to work a couple of times, but it didn't happen for different reasons. But uh, I would love to be under his direction. I think he's a genius. Do you have any desire to direct? No. Not at all. <laughs> I mean, you know how how hard it is. I mean, it's it's tough. I th I think I think the fun and the joy of working with actors uh, would make sense to me, but the whole surroundings of what it means to put a movie together, I don't think I'm ready for that. I it needs uh, it takes a lot of work and a lot of focus and a lot of strength and stubbornness to really be the captain of such a big boat of full of so many so many people. Mm -hmm. Well, so they pulled a gag on you on No Country for Old Man, but I hear you pulled a gag on uh, on Daniel Craig on his birthday. <laughs> oh, Is this the truth? Tell us what happened with that. Well, I'm March 1st. And thank you for reminding me that because tomorrow, March 2nd, is his birthday. I'll make sure that I, I test him. And we were doing Skyfall, and then uh, we celebrated the birthday together in a in a in a in a hotel. And I was so much into the mood of Silva, which he was this kind of homoerotic character that, beyond his sexuality, what he wanted to create is uncomfortableness in Mr. Bond. 
physically because that's something that we sam mendes amazing director and i discuss what can we do that hasn't been done yet to create uh, a situation with bond that where he kind of loses his his security and we thought he has to do something with the physicality because it's been done everything what about this guy that really approaches him through a different point of view through a different manner that you cannot easily read and he feels like he's a little bit lost with it so we kind of create a character based on that and i was in that mood and because i was in that mood i said i'm gonna be marilyn monroe and i'm gonna step out of the cake <laughs> and i have my blonde hair and my boa and uh, and then i did i sang happy birthday to you with my best marilyn monroe impersonation i could do which is horrible and he was laughing his ass off and ah, he was, ah. he's such a great beautiful loving man amazing actor and we were i remember being one of the best nights of my life we were having lots of fun sounds great it's again <laughs> the stories that we have for from movie sets are oh the best Oh my God, of course. Um, do you care uh, whether future films play theatrically or stream? Where do you, does it, does it matter to you? I mean, it matters. I was, I was raised by watching movies in movie theaters, in huge movie theaters of 600, 700, 1,000 people inside, of, of course. That's where all my love for movie making came from. At the same time, the world evolves and today we live in a place where there's a lot of content and thanks to those platforms they are giving lots of jobs they are giving lots of jobs to all the craft and technical craft actors artistic craft and and they are also producing movies that otherwise won't find their place or their room in the industry so it's not that i i want one thing alone is that I think we, like everything in life, we should find the balance. We should find the balance and live with it and find the best thing of both worlds, which is let's not, let's protect the movie theaters because that experience is a different experience, of course. I did a movie called The Good Boss in Spain, which is a, a comedy. And we were watching it in a full house with 700 people and the laughter of the audience all together, that's, that's sacred. I have some goosebumps. It's like to be in that room, it's something that you won't get back or you won't even get close to, near to, if you are in your home by yourself. So it's important. And at the same time, it's great that movies like Coda or movies like, I don't know, The Power of the Dog, uh, to name some, some uh, they are produced by platforms that otherwise, I don't know if they will find a producer to put together. Yeah, I, I understand. I just happened to, I don't know why, but uh, we ended up watching On Golden Pond the other night again, well, which was nominated for 10 Oscars in 1981, but it probably couldn't, couldn't get a theatrical release today. Exactly. Even with those great actors. And uh, right. for me, uh, comedies, uh, I did a comedy called Wayne's World, where well, yeah. it was... It was funny with four of us in the room, but when we played it to the audience, everybody went, wow, we got a hit. Exactly, exactly, so, exactly. Uh, yeah. Um, so the Oscar has always been for theatrical films uh -huh. until the last couple of years now. How do you think the Academy can navigate the changing landscape uh, and still be, still stay relevant? Because it's, you know, it's, well, that says it. You may have answered part of it already, but I don't know. I mean, I I know that I know that the world changes now. The the young audiences are looking to, I mean, are getting so much information all the time, constantly from different sources that <laughs> to to ask for anybody's attention, you really need to I don't know what you need to do. It's tough. It's tough. It's tough. It's tough for the audience. It's tough for the students to be able to focus and read a book and get concentrated for one hour in one thing without being driven by the anxiety of checking the phone constantly or thinking about something else because the the, the spam of attention, it's shorter and shorter. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know 
what is there to do for the Oscars uh, show to be more interested for the audience? I don't know. I don't know. What I do know is that yesterday we were the, we were in the Hollywood Critics Association award show, and it was relaxed. It was long though, but uh, it was relaxed. We were having fun. There was a great presenter doing the uh, an actress, which I'm sorry, I don't know the name, but she was brilliant, a Broadway actress uh, 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 presenter. She was presenting, and it was fun. And I was thinking, everybody that wants to have a good time will join this. Will join this because they are. It's fun. It's it's uh, it moves quick. I mean, the presentation, then the people, when they step, stand up there and talk for five minutes, that's a problem. That's a problem. It's like, you can't have people talking for four, five, seven minutes. Right. And at the same time, you understand, it's their moment and, you want, and, and, and they cannot control it. But for example, when I won, I was 45 seconds. <laughs> so, so because the, it's a show as well. It's a TV show that you have to be part of. So I, I want to move now to something else that you do that I am uh, so enamored with you and proud of what you do is your activism. Mm -hmm. uh, you participate. You've participated in several docs, uh, and uh, I'm sure it's made a difference in your life. The first one that I remember is Sanctuary about yeah. preserving marine life uh, mm -hmm. and creating a sea sanctuary in the Antarctic. Um, did, where did that come from in you? And, and had you been to the Antarctic or how did yeah. that happen? I guess what it comes from is the by the by my mom. My mom taught me to really be able to, I mean, to try to support as much as you can in the way you can to the cause of people that you think they need your voice and support. And there are so, unfortunately there are so many out there. Uh and I guess what I do is to try to learn the cause and what are we talking about, why, why it's important. And if I feel like I, I can do something for them, I can be of any value, of any, of, if I can be at any, any service for them, I will produce a documentary and I will be there and I will help. And that was the case with the Greenpeace. They asked me to join the campaign before I joined the campaign, I tried to understand what it was about, and I learned, and I read, and I sit down with them, and I listen from them, from people that do know what they're talking about. And of course, I agree with them. It's about the global warming. It's about the, how the, the polars, north and south, in this case, the south one, are the, ther thermo the thermometer of the, of the land. And it's telling us constantly that we are doing wrong. And for me it was an amazing experience to go for 10 days in that uh, uh, ex uh, exploration um, to go to the Antarctic and see in first hand what they do there, the biologists, the scientists, the activists, what they do there, the sailors that can stay nine months in the sea away from their families because they want to help to tell the story of the world to others. It's amazing. So I did that documentary and it, and it went well and it helped to bring the discussion to the table. But again, I mean, we can do very little. Uh, it's always about the same people who has to make the, the right decisions, the, the governments, the politics, the, 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 the economical lobbies. Right, that, well, that, today, that, today, I don't know what we can do about Ukraine. Crazy. But, yeah. but I, I'm, Every time I read somebody who has some kind of a voice doing something to help the Ukrainian people or the the situation there, I'm always very proud of those people. Some more than others, but uh, mm -hmm. I I hope that all of the the Hollywood community and unions take a stand, uh, even even if some people go, ah, they're only actors or they're only directors, mm -hmm. they're only Hollywood. I think because we do have such a voice that hopefully we can make even the slightest bit of difference. Yeah, and also I think when you are when you're speaking out loud for in the name of someone that you believe or a community or a, a minority, those people feel feel represented and that's important for them. 
you may not change the world, but you are helping them to be heard and listen. And in this case, like many other cases, I, what they say is that the first victim in any war is the truth, uh, because then the propaganda starts to take place for one place and for the other, uh, because we all need we all need to have enemies to fight for. So, and as and many other things in the world, it's a combined process of wrongs that create a horrible situation. In this case, in Ukraine, from what I've read, from what I know, Putin and his imperialistic, ultra-nationalist uh, thought of himself and his uh, country, that he controls so much without the voice of the opposition, uh, is, making, is making him do things that are so atrocious and so wild and so horrible. The victims are always the same, the civilian population. Yeah. And the the river of uh in the river of uh, um people thousands of people that are uh, of refugees that are coming towards the borders of europe is going is growing by the numbers every hour and every hour people like you and i yeah. uh at the same time we have to take responsibility i'm from europe you're from america uh we we need to also remind that we cannot expand the NATO basis and break the law of the statement that it was signed after the Cold War with Russia, because that is a way to strengthen the, the, the unresolved. Yeah. Exactly. The, the unresolved situation for Russia to give them an excuse to go and do these atrocities. Right. So it's a very complex situation, but at the, at the bottom line is we need to more or less, I mean, f obviously to focus on the victims and on the refugees and on the on the fact that today making a war, creating so much danger and pain, I mean, it's it's unbelievable. It's it's absolutely uh, something to point at and say that cannot happen. Diplomacy, diplomacy has to take place in today's world. It, it is it is. It is horrible, and in Europe, uh, we are living it in a way that it's it's our continent, and they are bombing people that we know of. And we, I mean, it's not because you know of is harder, of course, but every time a person, a human being, dies because somebody else throw a bomb, it's a failure for humanity, and that's something that we have to stand for. I agree with you 100, percent Javier. So let's. What's next for you? What what do we get to see you in next, or what's your next project? Well, changing the whole <laughs> thing now. Well, we're I'm talking just... about movies. We're yeah. talking about. I did a, a musical for kids called Lyle Lyle Crocodile. Uh, that uh, that my kids, basically my kids are my agents. Like I was <laughs> doing these movies, and then one day. They, Rob Marshall, which I adore, the director of Rob Marshall, director of Nine, director of uh, Chicago. Chicago, yeah. yeah, yeah. He called me to to be in the in the Little Mermaid, and I was having breakfast with my daughter, which she was six at the time, and my son who was uh, eight. And I said, "Wow, they called me to play to be in the in the in the Little Mermaid." And I saw my girl crying, and I said, "Luna, her name is." Luna. I'm not playing Ariel. <laughs> and she said, I know, you will be Queen Triton, right? And her face was like, oh, yes. I called my agent and said, I'm, I'm in. Don't even ask for money. I'm in. I mean, that's the reason why you do movies, <laughs> to see your own kids happy and proud of your daddy. So exactly. I did that one with Ron Marshall. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Great. Right. And, well, uh, and I did this other musical, and hopefully it will come out next year, this year and next year. Is is it American musical or, or a both? Spanish? Yeah, both, both. Uh, I'm so sorry, both are Amer American musicals. Ah, great. Well, we look forward to it, and I've got <laughs> several grandkids who I know will watch it as well. Of course, of so, course. Javier, this has been uh, this has been one of the great hours of my life. Thank you, Hog. Oh, it's been I, great. I, I love it. I so appreciate this, and, and I want to support. I want to support what you guys do with the home because my mom who passed away five months ago, as I was telling you yesterday, she's been directing uh, an organization, a foundation called AISGE, 
who does the same. He, she get the funds. She got the funds for many uh, the the rights of the actors in TV, theater, movies, and she created this huge uh, pool of fund to help to create the homes and to help to maintain and help them to survive through the hard times to many, many actors and actresses and dancers and comedians uh, through the pandemic and through and through the times of unemployment. So yeah. I know how important this is. And to have a place where you belong, where you are part of the family that knows you and you know them and you and they understand your passion and your background and your history is beautiful. So thank you for what you're doing. Well, thank you. And uh, Jen and Bob, uh, uh, Freda, uh, anybody have a question? I, I know you always have the one last question. Uh, Jen, you want to ask uh, Javier? Jen, before, before you ask it, let, can I just, uh, and you can end it on that, Javier, no one could express the, the purpose, the mission of who we are and what we do better than you just did. Thank because you. as you said right at the beginning, uh, the life, not only of an actor, but anyone working in this business is highly unstable, unpredictable. And uh, that's what our organization is here. I, I always talk about it as we're the safety net when you're walking that tightrope and you fall off, we're there to catch you. Whether it's, li whether it's living on our campus or getting financial assistance to bridge you or doing a palliative care program that is very much like the character in Beautiful, yeah. where, where we help uh, families like you described. So Bless thank you. you. Bless you all for doing so. Yeah. And it's important because people always see us walking the carpet. Yeah. And they don't understand that we are very much the very high point of the iceberg. Right. And for me, it's always been kind of a, of a law to remind as much as I can that we don't represent that we represent a huge number of great artists and craft that mostly are having a hard time to find a job. Yeah. And, and, and and that's something to remind people because otherwise they get a little bit confused. So thank <laughs> you for, your, for what you're doing. Yeah. And we hope to see you at our night before the Oscars party. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I would love yeah. to. And I want to go there and play bingo. Uh, <laughs> anytime. Oh, yes. Anytime. anytime. Yes. I love bingo. And I, 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 I'll, I'll scream those numbers very high. <laughs> uh, don't bring your money, Javier, because we've got some, we've got some bingo sharks here. Okay. I won. <laughs> we welcome you anytime you want to come. Yes. Thank you. Um, we also have virtual ways for you to stay involved with the residents like this. If you want to know about that, Hawk will talk right. you plenty of information. But if I may, I'm going to ask you the really difficult questions that we ask everybody. All right. Ready. Okay. What is your favorite film and what is your favorite television series? Not your own. Not your own. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think I answered that. Uh, the first movie that I saw when I was very young, believe it or not, because my mom was doing theater, she was touring and she will take the, the kids with her. And she wanted to see that movie so bad that she, she sneaked me in. It was all that jazz. Ah, wow. wow. I would say that for me, I don't know how old I was, seeing those naked women dancing <laughs> with this guy having drugs and alcohol, I was like, all right, I got it. <laughs> but I mean, it is, it stays with me like a masterpiece, a masterpiece of a movie, and also a great radiography of an artist, of a yes. very obsessed artist. Yes. Phenomenal idea. And, and TV series, TV series, it's funny, I, I'm so bad at it. I, I always make a joke, but it's true. The only series that I saw from beginning to the end is Falcon Crest. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that a lot of people watching this know what I mean. When I see this to the younger generation, they go, Falcon what? They go, Falcon <laughs> Crest is the only one that I saw from beginning to the end. I'm so bad at this. <laughs> Those are great answers. Thank you so much for being with us. Hawk, as always, you bring the amazing star power, and we just want to wish you the best of luck in all of the award seasons. Thank you for everything you've done this year. Thank and you again, Javier. Thank you, I will, Javier. I'll see you Monday at the nominees luncheon. Oh, great. Hug. I'll give you a big hug. Oh, great. <laughs> love to see you. Thank you very much. I Thank love the conversation. Thank you for having me.
Thank you, guys. Here are the trailers for what's coming up on the TV station this week, and we'll be right back with Harry's Poetry Hour. La realtà non mi piace più. La realtà è scadente. <laughs> 